and welcome back to another episode of the Real Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jake Bocconner. Real Conversations is a podcast for those dedicated to doing hard things and living a meaningful life. This is week 11 in business now? I believe so. Yeah. I think it's week 11. Yeah. We're heading towards three months of being open, and I know we kind of had a target of doing one of these every month. Got thrown off a little bit somewhere, but we're doing a Q&A life update episode, and uh, John Peterson back in the studio. Yeah, this is him. This is him. We're here. <laughs> he, he is, in fact, here. <laughs> he is, in fact, present. So, Can you do this full episode in third person? I could do it. He could do it. <laughs> uh, if you see the Christmas tree behind us, if you're watching the video, uh, it is currently December 5th, December 5th right now. We uh, have a, a small but mighty Christmas tree, and we've partnered with the Ronald McDonald House of Wichita, and it's a giving tree. So if you want to come and do another broken egg, um, two miles north of WSU off Oliver, we have these little, um, I don't even know, what would you call those, like little tags? or Yeah, they're little tags. We, we have these little tags and written on the back are items that you can pick up a tag. You can go get the items from the store, Amazon, whatever's easiest for you, and then drop it back off under the tree. And then John and I are going to drive them over to Toronto McDonald and, and make the, the donation for everyone. But it's a really good cause. You've got to know the folks over there. And uh, I'm, I'm happy we get to do something like that. Yeah, it's cool. It's, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's good because I don't think you'd never been in the Ronald McDonald house, right? Never before that, yeah. that last meeting. Me either. Um, Eye opening, really eye opening. Yeah, we are all so fortunate. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Very blessed this holiday season. Yes, sir. So, uh, rolling into the festivities here, we have a list of questions you guys submitted. You guys can submit those via my Instagram or just text me or John or whatever. We'll just keep a catalog rolling from each episode onto the next. Um, I don't know if we're going to make it through all of the questions because some of them are long and some of them. And there's a decent amount of them. So we'll we'll see how many we make it through. But overall, pretty solid questions that came our way. Solid. All right, let's do it. Love to see it from the crowd. Mm -hmm. All those people in the back. In the back. Uh, you want a softball? Or you want to just dive right into it? Uh, let's get a softball. Let's get us warmed up here. Okay. Dream vehicle. Mm, dream vehicle. Probably... Just for the, the fun aspect of it, a Bugatti. A Bugatti? I think you go all in with Dream Vehicle. Seriously? Yeah. I think you have to go all in. I It's not practical in any right. stretch of the imagination, but I think it, it'd be cool. Yeah. It'd be really awesome. Mine has changed very recently because of an experience you and I had. I, I'm going to say Rolls Royce. Mm, fair what, enough. What, what's the one that Harley had? Uh, is it a ghost or a phantom I think ghost sounds right ghost does sound right we, we had a gentleman come into the restaurant and super super nice guy john and i chatted with him he he's kind of become a regular and at one point in the conversation he goes do you guys like cars and i was like yeah and so he invited john and i over to just kind of to talk shop and he showed us his car collection and it was the first rolls royce i've ever seen in person and i have not stopped thinking about it since then it was sweet it was very cool. Plus, he had a bunch of uh, classic cars. So those were yeah, those were awesome. Too. Yeah, it, it was a, a really cool collection, and I love doing that type of stuff because, I mean, there there is no way I could afford anything in that garage that he has. But it, I feel like it's cool because not that we're necessarily materialistic people, but it's almost like you're you're living in like a potential for, version of the future. Like if someone else could attain it, and he told us his story, he didn't. He didn't even graduate middle school. It's like eighth grade he dropped out or something. Like it, if you can go from that to what he's been able to accomplish, it just, I just find it really inspiring. I love getting to see that type of stuff and think, yeah, one day, maybe one day. One day soon, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully soon. Yeah. Just keep making the right moves. Holy cow. Yeah. Your comment of one day soon is actually perfect to segue into the next question which is a great question. It is, how do you balance patience and aggressive growth? Hey guys, Jacob here. Real quick before we get back to the episode, I just want to take a quick second and say, if you guys are enjoying this episode, please make sure to share the link with a friend. You may have noticed I don't run any ads in the podcast. In fact, I don't make any money off the podcast. It's quite the contrary. Over the past five years, I've invested a lot of time, money, and effort into the growth of the show, trying to continually upgrade the equipment, bring on better guests, and just improve the overall quality of the podcast. So if you guys are enjoying this episode or if you enjoyed previous episodes, please share the link with a friend. Saying it to one or two people makes a huge difference for me on the back end. As always, I appreciate your guys' support. 
let's get back into the episode. Mm. I don't know. I think that's the right the right answer. Uh, I don't know. I think the fun part is you and I have never done this before, so we're figuring that out as we go. Yeah. How aggressive do we need to be? How much do we push our people? That's a big one. It's just it. It's got to be a balance, but at the same time, it's like you got to move as quickly as possible. I think you and I err on the side of aggressive growth. And I think that's normal for most people that are young, just getting started and have a lot of ambition. I think both you and I like rationally understand the importance of patience and like are trying our best to be patient. But I, I will say I, I tilt way much, way further towards aggressive growth. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, I, I, and I think it's situational more than anything. I mean, I think, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that, but yeah. It, the, what, what I'm trying to do is like understand that the numbers tell you the story. Like the numbers in the restaurant have to make sense in order to, you know, open more restaurants, if that's the example that we're using. And so it's like, you can be impatient, but the numbers aren't going to lie to you. And so I think you and I just deciding what numbers are important and how do we, where do you want to set those milestones at and just like building a framework and not just kind of haphazardly making decisions based off gut feeling. Right. Yeah. There's, I don't. Are they in the roof? I think they're on the roof. If you guys can hear this, we've been getting a new roof. This is actually, uh, this is, this is good. Yeah. So yeah. We, we are a tenant in a strip mall. And one of the things that happened is we've had a couple of leaks in the restaurant and it's because parts of the roof kind of were installed incorrectly and whatnot. And so here in December, we have been in the midst of getting a new roof. And so we've had drilling going on throughout the day and it's, it's been a little bit of a headache, but that's, that's part of the responsibility of being a business owner. Yeah, I guess so. Always learn and be flexible. Yeah. So. Yeah. Is that it on patience and aggressive yeah, growth for you? I think so. I mean, <clears throat> I think the consensus that I came to is that we're, we're, we're still trying to figure out what that means. I think we are very aggressive. So yeah. Aggressive maybe. for sure. Yeah. Trial by fire. Yeah. Um, you know, because it's the holiday season, we got the Christmas tree behind us. I want to do a quick little shout out here, actually drinking first form energy. First form is a St. Louis company and, um, had Andy and Sal Frisella, two of the founders in the podcast. Really, really love that company. They're doing great things. And the other shout out I want to give, I'm wearing the normal brand, another great St. Louis company that I've had on the podcast. Two great companies. You should support local great companies as well. Definitely. Good companies, good products. Do you have any shout outs? No. Okay. Shout out myself. <laughs> shout out I'm another just, broken I'm egg. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Shout out another broken egg in Wichita, Kansas. Four yeah. eight four eight six two East thirty fifth Street North, Wichita. Six seven two two zero. You've got that down pat. Heck yeah, man. I've said it a lot of times. All right. Next question is Man, you threw me on the spot with the do I have any shout outs? I don't have any shout outs. Well, you can think about it and give one. No, nah, it's okay. You can do it later on. That's all right. What are goals you are working towards for another broken egg weekly, monthly, a year out? And then how do those short term goals impact and push further the big goals? Hmm. It's interesting because I don't know how how much we want to dive into it. I mean, we've got we've got weekly goals that we want to hit in terms of uh you know, and these these categories are across the board for restaurants. Our labor goals, our sales goals, and our food cost goals. Those are the big three. Um and you know, we're kind of in the beginning stages of owning a restaurant, operating a restaurant. So for us, we're still trying to figure out what those are, where we can push the boundaries to um, comfortably without sacrificing guest experience. I think that's that's the biggest thing that we have heard from the serial entrepreneurs in the space is you definitely want to get as lean as possible. You want to get those numbers down. You, obviously, your your margins as high as they can be without sacrificing the guest experience. Right. That's the main, main goal right there. So, um, that's our weekly, weekly meetings with our managers and stuff like that is hitting those goals, making sure that we're at least getting towards, um, where we want to be in those goals. I don't think we're there yet. Um, but moving in that right direction and 
maybe even having them understand why we're trying to get to the goals that we are. Right. So on a daily and weekly basis, that's what we're looking at. From a more long-term basis, I think we're, we're looking at how can we grow as a business, You know, whether that's a number two, how can we get closer to a, a second location? How can we grow this location, increase catering, different things like that to add revenue? Yeah, uh, I, just some industry kind of averages here. So you have what is called your prime cost, and that is your uh, food cost and your cost of labor. Those are two of your biggest expenses as a restaurant, and you want that to be less than 50%. And so if if you have a total amount of revenue that you're doing monthly, then 50% of your cost should be, it, it should be 50% or less should be your prime. And, and uh, wow, I actually butchered that. Your prime cost. It should be your prime cost. Either your prime cost. Labor and food. Yeah, labor and food. So we're watching labor and food very tightly. But to John's point, like labor is the people on the floor in the front of the house and then in the back of the house. And if you start saying, well, you know what? I'm going to decrease my labor and I'll save more money and I'll make more money because I'm, I'm spending less on labor. But that starts to drive, at a certain threshold, that starts to drive the guest experience down because now you don't have enough servers. So- each table's not getting enough attention or you don't have enough people in the back house. So ticket times are running longer. And it's super interesting because the, you have like this first thought of just decreased labor and you save more money. But then like the fun part of getting to operate and dive deep into a business is you start to understand every single lever that when you pull that first one, all these smaller level levers get pulled too. And there's, it's a really, really delicate balancing act. And so you have to think both from an operational standpoint, but then also from like a financial standpoint. And that's kind of what we're learning to feel out now. Yeah. And it's hard because, you know, you get in at seven o'clock and maybe you don't have that many customers and some people are standing around for a while and you're waiting for that pop. I mean, the the variability that we have on a day-to-day basis is fascinating. I mean, it's, and and once we get more, you know, in tune with, kind of how this area operates, kind of what customers, uh, you know, what, what am I trying to say? The customer habits, yeah, I the, guess. The behaviors, yeah. Yeah, customer habits, customer behaviors. We'll be able to better predict that. But at this point, we kind of have all hands on deck f- for the most part. Yeah, that that's like, so right, right now in the restaurant, like it, we just had Thanksgiving, we're heading towards Christmas. We're seeing at our restaurant like a small, a little amount of slowdown as far as guest traffic and revenue week over week. And it's hard because we haven't been open for a full year to understand the seasonality. Because in restaurants, what we're being told by mentors and other operators is that seasonality is is a huge thing to understand. So when you have 12 months that you've operated, you can then look historically and say, well, last October was awesome. And then November was a slight decrease. December was a slight decrease. January picked up. February picked up. And then April, May were huge, and et cetera. And so we're, we just have to take people's advice right now and kind of wait until we have that entire 12-month period to where we can then compare that historically. And so the the first 12 months is is going to be a really fun roller coaster for us. Sure is. It's a lot of figuring out kind of where we can, like you said, pull the levers. Where can we pull the levers at? Yeah. So, And what is our team capable of? Yeah. That's the, I think that's the, part that excites me the most is just we see people in stressful situations that you know they haven't been in before and they either perform really well and we decide okay maybe we can pull that lever a little bit here and there yeah or maybe we go yeah we shouldn't pull that lever anymore you know what i mean yeah so that's fun it's a lot of fun to see a a great learning experience that we had is sunday is typically our busiest day of the week it I mean, we do a lot of traffic on the weekends, very high revenue days for us. And two weekends ago, we did a catering for our church here in Wichita. And it was a hundred person catering on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. right after church lets out there. 9 a.m. is a very busy time for us on a Sunday here. And so we wanted to do it just to see what the cafe could handle and how that affected operations. So we did a hundred person catering at the same time trying to get food out to everyone in a full restaurant. And we will not be doing that again. It it was too much for the kitchen. We had a capacity issue because the window where you put the food up, it it shrunk so much because we were doing the catering and that takes up half the window. And then you've only got half the window left for the people that are in the restaurant. And it it was a bandwidth issue. 
So that that was a good learning lesson of a lever that we tried to pull that we now have data on. Which totally directly corresponded to our guest uh, experience. Yeah, it, and it, so that, it definitely that, decreased a little bit that day. That that tied it all back together. It's like, okay, that was that was the deciding factor is our guests in restaurant are waiting a little bit longer than they should have been. Yeah. And so that's, you know, that was the deciding. Yeah. So weekly goals, I mean, when you just get the restaurant open, your overhead and your expenses are, are all out of whack because y- you have a new team, you've got a new restaurant, like there's just so many unknowns and variables. So then you spend the first like six months trying to get everything kind of tightened to get your normal flow lined up. So week over a week, we're setting goals, trying to get ourselves closer to where we want to end up at that 12 month mark. As far as like how that informs each month, each month, we've only been open two, but so far each month, we print off our income statement, our profit and loss statement, and then look at how all of those numbers ended up at the month, and then try and paint a picture based off what those numbers were telling us. What what happened with the expenses? What was revenue? Why was this different than that? Yeah, we see the health of our business. Yeah. In a roundabout way, where we spent money, where we overspent money. It's a it's a cool thing to see the allocation of where our dollars went and what that effect was on the bottom line. Right. Cause there is, I mean, you see it, it, it's, it's interesting. You're like, Oh, this is just 20 bucks here, 20 bucks there, but it, it adds up and it just hits the bottom line. You're like, Oh, I could have had yeah. 60 more bucks. You also see where you're underspending. Like we realized we have a lot more marketing budget that we could spend that we just didn't know was there. Cause we were trying to be tight. Right. So, Yeah. Super interesting. Um, and then how that informs long-term, I mean, just it, as long as we can perform every day, then hopefully we'll be able to perform every week and then every month and then just be able to have stellar years and go from there. Yeah. Day to day. That, that's the advice that we get a lot. I mean, we had a great meeting yesterday um, with, with a, a, a pretty solid guy and his advice to us is just like focus on every individual day. He's like, the outcomes take care of themselves if you're doing the right things in the right places at every opportunity each day. Right. So that's that. That's that. Have any shout outs yet? Mm. Shout out our team, man. We got a good team. I would agree with that. They really kill it. All they right. They really kill it. Next up, we have I don't know how you keep such a disciplined mindset with everything you're doing. How are you not only mentally keeping up with everything, but continue to stay positive? And on the grind when you have those bad or day, or days where you're sick and exhausted or whatever's going on. What's your mindset through those? How do you push through? And how do you continue to be disciplined through it all? It's a good question. It's a really good question. Um, I think for me, just visualizing what the outcome could be if we do everything right. Uh, I'm a... I'm a big like best case scenario guy. And, but then I also look at the worst case scenario. That's just to a fault. What I do, I'm like, okay, what happens if everything falls apart? But I think what keeps me motivated is, is saying, okay, what happens if everything, everything goes right? You know what I mean? What happens if this restaurant just does super well, we perform wonderfully. We move to another restaurant. We move to another one after that. And it's just like that snowball effect. It just excites me. It it makes me feel like, what can I do today to make that goal a little bit more attainable for five years down the line? Or you know, so I guess waking up every day. That's that's kind of what I I visualize and I see. Um, and I think it's it's fun for me. I like this. It's fun. I would rather do this than a nine to five. Hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah, so you're saying it's like you wake up and it's like the possibility that's on the table, like the the opportunity of what this could become is kind of what pulls you. Yeah, I, I think so. Also, I think another motivator is we've got people that are really depending on us now. Yeah. So it's it's not as much of a voluntary thing anymore. It's like you got to get up. You got you got people that are waiting on you. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's another thing. So. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, we've got like 40 total people on, on payroll and I mean, we've got two salaried folks as well. So that, that's a lot of pressure. It's a good thing. It is. I like it. 
Yeah. I really like it. I, I definitely consider like what's on the table and definitely very like goal oriented with that. Um, I, I get excited about like the opportunity to try and be my best self every day. And I mean, that doesn't happen every day, obviously, but I really do feel like we, we, we've been working so hard for a fair amount of time and we have a very non-traditional schedule. We're, we're not doing a lot of the things that people our age are doing, and that's a bit of a sacrifice. But what excites me is like how that's just going to continue to compound. Like I already feel extremely grateful for the opportunity that we have and the people that we continue to get to meet and the opportunities that continue to come our way. And it, it, you just kind of sit there and you're like, wow, how does this happen? Like, how do we get to end up in such a cool place? And why, how do we have such good people around us? And, you know, the only two things that comes down to in my mind is like, A, I mean, God for sure, but B, being your best self at every opportunity, like doing your best not to take a shortcut, not to take the easy way out, like if we want some sort of outcome or some sort of result that most people aren't going to get, then we have to have a different input. We have to do things that other people aren't willing to do. And so, I mean, that, that really excites me is just like literally how can we do everything at the best of our ability? And then I just, whenever things aren't working, I just want to go harder. It's like, okay, well, you, know, you must not be sacrificing enough or you must not be doing the right things. Like let's analyze, let's, let's not shy away. Let's just dive deeper into it. Yeah, sometimes to a def detriment, I think, on How's both that? sides. I mean, because I, I find myself, like you just said, uh, you know, if things aren't working, maybe I'm not sacrificing enough. Mm -hmm. It's like, I think that's sometimes to a detriment of like, okay, this is failing. Let me sacrifice a little bit more and then a little bit more and then a little bit more. And like, there's a lot of areas where that, helps out but i've i've seen some areas where i'm just like hmm, maybe i'm sacrificing too much you know what i mean yeah or, i feel like there's good balance with that or analyzing too much right yeah analysis paralysis i find myself doing that too just you sit there you're like okay sometimes you just have to do it yeah you just gotta do it yeah sometimes the the element that's missing in that equation for that outcome is, is time yeah like that back to the aggressive growth versus patience like Maybe you're doing the right things daily and you don't see the results you want, but maybe the missing piece is literally just time. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that's cool though. I mean, it's, I'm glad that's both of our kind of default mindset rather than just not caring Yeah, or just doing it halfway. Uh, I think we have to be aligned. I mean, if, if we were not aligned on it, we would be in in bad shape. I mean, realistically one of us would one of us would be pulling pulling the ship and the other one would be sitting in there with a martini i mean yeah. you know <laughs> Dude, what that's I mean? a great analogy you know what i mean uh that's that's what it is can you imagine if just like i didn't show up to the restaurant in the morning and you're just calling me constantly and you're like hey you gonna wake up this morning you coming in it wouldn't work out that long it, you that it would not and I, I mean, to, to your boat analogy, I think we also do a good job of recognizing when the other person is just maybe going through a funk or just it, the value of needing a little bit of decompressing time. Mm -hmm. I, I think we're pretty good at like when the other person may be slightly down, the other person just kind of steps up is how I feel. Yeah. It's gone back and forth with us. Yeah. Because I, I never feel like it's a, it's a, you know, Oh, he needs time out of the restaurant. I'll take my time, you know, yeah. tomorrow or whatever. I'm like, we're in this for the same goal. Like if I need a de decompression day, I know that you're going to step up yeah. and work your ass off just as, as much as if I was there. Yeah. And I know that if I'm off a day or sick a day or whatever, you're going to do the same thing. Yeah. So it, it feels kind of nice if I'm being honest to be able to give that space. Cause then, it, then it feels like, okay, he's recharging and I know he's got me in, the, in that situation whenever I end up there too. 100%. It, it, it really is a nice feeling to have in the back of your mind, that comfort. Yeah. So. Uh, I was I was trying to think of two quotes. There's an Alex Hormozzi quote mm -hmm. that I was trying to think of and a uh, Huberman Labs. 
Look at you. Quote that, but I, I was going to butcher them. So I was like, yeah, I'm not going to say. You don't remember either of them? Uh, one was like, there's two ways to live your 20s. One, you're, you're either an underlived 20 year old or like an underworked 20 year old. Oh, interesting. Your, that, is that Hormozy? Uh, no, that's, that's Huberman. Seriously? And, um, can't think of what his name is. Is that on a podcast? Mm hmm. Was it Modern Wisdom? Yes, I believe. So. Chris Williamson. I was going to say that sounded familiar. Uh, I no? I think it was. Mm -mm. Hmm. What was the other quote? I can't remember. Or Mozzie's now. But. Yeah. There, there is a quote that I like from um, Andy Frisella that I had on the podcast that I think pertains to this. It says, and it's a little bit extreme, to be fair. I mean, you can live your life however you want to. But he says, work-life balance in your 20s leads to broke-life balance for the rest of your life. Be careful what ideology you subscribe to. There's what sounds good and what feels good. Then there's reality. Mm. I don't make the rules. Dang. That's deep. Yeah. That's deep. There is, I'm pulling this other quote up. I, I actually really like that. Wait, there's sir, no sir. perfect way to live your 20s. You either live them up and become an underskilled 30-year-old, or you work them up and become an underlived 30-year-old. You just have to figure out which you'd rather be, accept the trade-offs, and know that there are no do-overs. Heck yeah. Yeah, cool that's, that? that's Chris Williamson. That's Chris Williamson? I love Chris Williamson. Dang. Yeah. That's sick. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I just listen to that on replay at the gym. It's freaking amazing. I mean, it, to me, it just feels like the right mindset because what what do you lose from giving your all at something? Like, you're going to gain skills. You're going to hopefully grow your network. You're going to learn about yourself. Like, right. we, there, there's no downside to to kind of giving a damn about your life instead of just being passive and just not to just thinking, Oh, it's all going to work out and it's going to be fine. And I don't need to, I mean, there, there's a little bit of a balance with it for sure, but right. I'd much rather be on the side of how do I become a better version of myself? Because that's just going to help other people be it besides myself. Yeah. I think there's a, there's an aspect of falling into comfortability too, just, not doing things because you know it's going to lead to other things that might be harder. I don't want to start something because, you know, it's going to take such and such time that I have allocated to other things. And I don't know. You're saying, you're saying that on the comfort side or on the work side? On the, uh, like that's, that's the reason why I'm going to move over. I was going to say that sun is starting to kill you, man. Sorry. You're good. That's better. I'm saying that on like the, I'm comfortable. And if I, if I, you know, branch out and do this other thing, my life is going to be totally that thing and nothing else. And you're saying that's a good thing or a bad thing? I'm saying thing? that's a bad thing. Yeah. I'm, I guess I'm saying that people make excuses. Yeah. It, it's like the, I mean, that is a version of analysis paralysis. It's like the, the unknown is it's not worth it. It's, I don't even want to step in that direction. But then people complain about their current situation. I mean, that's what really drives me crazy. It's like, if you don't like how things currently are, you can say something if you're making a solid effort to make a difference. But if you're just continuing the same day over and over and over again, and then complaining about the outcome, what are you doing about it? Yeah. You say you want change, but you don't want to change. Man. Crazy. What kind of John Peterson showed Crazy. up to this episode? Who even is this guy? I love it. All right, what do we got left? I need to put these all in one place because people text them and then put them on Instagram and then DM and just is a little bit inefficient. All right, we got three more questions. Someone asked if I have a girlfriend. The answer is yes, I do. Whoa. I know. Dropped it right on the podcast, the Christmas episode. I, I don't know if this is the Christmas episode. I feel like we'll do a big holiday. We'll wear Santa hats to do a big holiday episode. Fair enough. The yeah. pre-Christmas holiday episode. Yes, this is the, the lead up to the Christmas holiday episode. Fair enough. But yeah, exciting stuff. It is. It's uh, something I have not... 
I, I've it's been a while since since I've had a girlfriend. So that that is the nice part of like. I I didn't think necessarily that I would have time for a girlfriend, but because I I was like, well, that's time I could be working and doing things for the business and whatever else. But carving out a little bit of time, a couple times a week, I I felt the positive effects of that. It's it's been very nice actually to to kind of have that element where it's not work and you enjoy it and it's just it's been kind of a benefit. Kind of a benefit. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here, folks. You heard it, heard it here first. It's not totally a benefit, just kind of. So, well, that's good. I'm glad. I mean, is that how you feel about your relationship? I think it's a benefit in the long term. Not the short term. <laughs> I mean, it is in the short term too, but it, yeah, it's. I guess I would consider it more variable in the short term. Yeah. And there's a lot of sacrifices and different things you have to work on on a day-to-day basis that do take away from other things, but yeah, that's fair. I think from a from an overall health perspective, it, it's it's good. Yeah. I feel like we're digging ourselves a hole. Next question. Yep. All right. How do you think Trump will affect the restaurant industry? I don't know. I'm kind of, uh, I'd be interested to see what six months looks like, what 12 months looks like in terms of like political nature and terms of the economy and stuff like that. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I'm the right person to uh, make predictions on the economy yeah, or po- politics. I'm not a politics guy. No, not at all. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. We'll it's, see. It's funny because I know you hate politics. I really do hate politics. Yeah. But I, I, I'm telling myself that I need to learn more and pay attention more. Yeah. Speaking purely from an economic standpoint, what I have at least heard is that having – Donald Trump in office will give people more confidence in the economy because of his business background and because they felt that, I mean, if you look at the stock market during his first term, so economically, consumer sentiment is hopefully that he instills confidence in the market. And that's good for us because when the market's doing well, people have more money to spend, which means they can have more discretionary income, which they can then take to another broken egg and come sit down and talk to you and I and eat breakfast with us. Eat some eggs. Eat some eggs. Uh, The other element is, I have not read this, but I thought I heard from someone that he was looking at removing tax on tipped employees, which would directly affect us because we have to capture both cash and credit tips for our employees. And then they are taxed on that at the end of the year. And if they were able to not be taxed on that, that's more money in their pocket, which positively affects our employees, which would be huge and I'm all for it. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Yeah. Those are the only two things that I feel like I can comment on. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Least favorite vegetable. Mm. Um, let me see on that one. There's going to be a long pause because there are some vegetables I don't like. I'll go real quick because yeah, you go ahead. I hate onions. Really? I hate onions. Mm. It's not, they don't even really have a, a flavor to me. It's just the, the crunch of it. And it's like, I like other pep, I like peppers and jalapenos and, you know, other crunchy vegetables, but I can just for some reason distinguish an onion's crunch and just the idea of an onion. And it, it does upset my stomach. I don't know if that's some sort of allergy or something, but onions entirely, I agree with no part of them. Mm. I like onions. I'm a big onion guy. Mm. On a burger, I like a good onion on my burger. I I got our um, oh, what's the or I got the Hey Lucy omelet this morning, mm-hmm. which has avocado, chorizo, and it comes with green chili and onion. And I was in a rush, and so I asked the back of house to make it, and they're kind enough to do so. But I asked them to make it without onion, and they made it with onion. And I didn't say anything, but I sat there, and I immediately the first bite I was like, oh, there's onion in this. Dang. I was like, just keep eating it. <laughs> Dang, brutal. Yeah. Yeah, that's a rough one. Uh, for me, sautéed spinach. Spinach? Yeah. I like spinach raw. 
big raw spinach guy. There's nothing wrong with it. But sauteed, I can't do it. When somebody puts it in their eggs, or if they put it in like a sandwich or something, oh, they just get mushy and they get wet. <laughs> That's right. Get a like a nasty Taylor. She loves sautéed spinach. Oh, that's tough. She likes to put in her eggs and everything. Can't do it. Makes me want to be sick to my stomach. Is it? Is it the texture? Texture and taste. Oh, it's both. Okay. Texture and taste. Slimy, man. Yeah. Just slimy. Yeah. That's, Gross. That's really tough. I'm trying to think if there's any other vegetables I really don't like. I like asparagus. Brussels sprouts. I actually really like grilled asparagus. It's good. With a little butter glaze on it. Mm. Oh, Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's good. I'm trying to think. Tomatoes. I don't like tomatoes that much. Oh, yeah. I don't like tomatoes either. Yeah. That's the only two, I think. Tomatoes and onion. I'm sure there's probably more. But. Do you feel like your palate's expanded as you've gotten older? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't like, used to like onions. Now I like onions. I don't know if that's in my future. <laughs> 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 I, I didn't like peanut butter growing up, which is. I mean, I feel like everyone likes peanut butter. I like peanut butter. Now, now I really enjoy peanut butter. Yeah. What else? I didn't like vegetables when I was a kid. Like, I, <laughs> it's tough. I liked, I would eat a salad, like broccoli I liked, but I really wouldn't branch out. I didn't like spinach. Didn't like a lot of vegetables. Like peppers, wasn't a fan of peppers. I didn't like peppers either. Yeah. There's a lot of things. Like, if somebody was like, yeah, you're you're going to go to a Mexican restaurant and get one of those, uh, what do they call those? They're not skillets, but they're- Where it comes out in it. Fajitas? Yeah. Fajitas. I'd be like, yeah, no. I don't like the peppers and the green, the green stuff. Yeah. I was not a fan of the green stuff, but I like it now. It's good. I think growing up, it was like, if I want flavor on whatever I'm eating, like give me some sort of sauce. And then, because I didn't like peppers or any of that type of stuff. And now it's like- Ooh, if I can get it from the pepper, the jalapeno, like whatever it is, that I, I really like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So definitely expanded though. I don't like seafood either back in the day. I don't eat much seafood. I don't, salmon's about all I've really had. Hmm. Yeah. I like lobster. Our lobster. I, our lobster is good. Yeah. I, I have had that. So someone, oh yeah. I was talking with the, one of our cooks today. He makes sushi all the time. I've never, I've had like one bite of sushi. I don't even remember what it was, but I've never been to a sushi place, never really had sushi before. Hmm. You should try it. It's I good. I, I need to. I just, it's really good. I don't know what my mental hurdle is. I think it's, actually, I think it's because I don't know what I'm looking at because I've never had any of it. It's like going to look at that menu. I'm just like, I don't even know what this is. Well, and the problem that I find is that it's so expensive for what you get. Mm. I mean, Dylan's actually has some really good, it's like Kroger almost. Um, or schnooks back home yeah. in St. Louis. Is that our schnooks? Uh, like a, a, a local-ish store. But they've got some good sushi options in there. I'll have to try that then. Just like try out different ones. So it was good. Yeah. It's good. Expensive, but it's good. Well, this has been fun. <laughs> this is fun. This is fun. Yeah. I'm, trying to, I'm still trying to think what Hormozzi said. He's got some good quotes. Some of them I don't agree with. He had one posted two days ago where it was like, I missed, I didn't go to any of my friends' weddings for 10 years and I didn't take any vacations and look at where I am now. And I'm like, really? Yeah. I'm, you're going to skip your friend's wedding for work? And I, I, I get it in an extreme situation where things are on fire at your business, but to brag about the fact you didn't make it to any of your friend's weddings I was not vibing with that. Yeah, that's no that's no good. Yeah. There's there's got to be a balance. Yeah. Has to be a balance. Cuz I feel like even if we are working a ton, like it's still that life resume component that Jesse Itzler always talks about. Like going to do the ultra marathon and you covering the restaurant for me and like finding little gaps. I mean are are they not vacation, but our experiences have to be shorter now than they used to be like it can't be we're gone for a week. But I think you and I are both still like, all right, 36 hours, 48 hours. Like, how do we still go have those experiences? Because we're 23 and 24, and I don't want my life to just be work. I, I love working. I'm happy to do a lot of it. But I'm still trying to build that life resume of all of those other components, too. 
hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm excited for what life has in store. Indeed. Okay. I think this is heading towards a natural end. Again, we've got the tree behind us. If you want to come over to another broken egg and pick up one of the tags, read one off to them. Oatmeal cups. Oatmeal cups. I see protein bars. I see hygiene products. Yeah. So just, we're, we're going to donate them all. It goes to a really good cause. And um, yeah, just come check out another broken egg. 4862 East 35th Street. And uh, thank you guys for listening. Peace.